Hi, I'm April Sorrow from Jackson EMC in Jefferson, Georgia. Welcome to Along Those Lines. This podcast is supported by TextPower, providing texting services for over 175 utilities. 95% of text messages are read within three minutes. TextPower's two-way texting is ideal for outages, load shedding, disconnect notices, and more. Hi, everyone. This is a podcast about electric cooperatives, the work they do, and the challenges they face. I'm your host, Scott Hoffman. In recent surveys, electric co-op members say that the highest expectation they have of their cooperative is essentially the same as it's always been, access to reliable and affordable power. But over the last decade or so, a flood of new industry technologies has begun offering consumers unprecedented insights into and control over their power use. And members have responded by asking their co-ops for a host of new services and offerings. These run the gamut from wanting input on the sources of their electricity to 24-7 access to their energy data to help with purchasing and charging an electric vehicle. The advent of this highly engaged and empowered modern member is driving broad changes in the way electric co-ops do business and how they communicate about the services they offer. To discuss this challenging trend, we'll talk to two longtime co-op leaders who work closely with the co-ops in their states to help them keep up with member demands. First, we'll hear from Nell Hotchkiss. She's Senior Vice President of Association Services and Chief Operating Officer in North Carolina's Electric Cooperatives, the statewide association. Later, we'll talk to Lisa Johnson. She's CEO and General Manager of Seminole Electric Cooperative, a generation and transmission co-op based in Tampa, Florida. Nell, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I can't believe it's taken us so long to get you on here. Well, thank you, Scott. I'm happy to be here. Okay, so I want to start at a fairly high level. We're talking about changing consumer expectations, particularly regarding their electricity provider. To sort of set the stage, what kind of expectations are we talking about? What kind of changes are our members going through? Well, I think we need to step even back a little further from that and say the fundamentals really aren't changing. Member consumers still expect affordability and reliability. If you do any survey work, and we've used Cooperative Insights and the National Survey for Cooperative Difference with Touchstone Energy for years, and if you look at the data, the data still shows that roughly 55% of the membership really wants reliability. That's the attribute that they most value. The second value is affordability. So really, as we transition or we go through this energy transition, the real magic is going to be how do we continue to have reliability and affordability but then integrate the new distributed energy resources perhaps member owners want or additional sustainability goals that may be out there and and we have them in North Carolina. That really only came in about 12%, although it's growing. So I think that is a continuing trend that we'll watch. Yeah. And can you give us sort of a sense of when this trend started? I mean, we talk about the Amazon effect and how consumers sort of felt more empowered as Amazon uh, sort of delivered everything to their fingertips. When would you say this trend started developing? Well, I think it's named the Amazon effect. And I think that's for a reason. Prior to COVID, As we saw more and more people having smart devices, being online, having immediate response from companies, online chats, all of the new technology, as more and more people are using that technology, the expectation is higher for a response and a response that they believe is appropriate from any company, and that includes an electric cooperative. So all of our member owners live in the same world as everybody else, and so that continued expectation is there. Electric cooperatives, regardless of where they are in the country, need to respond to that, in my view. And in doing so, it's bringing in new technologies, a new way to pay bills and to interact or engage with your cooperative becomes important. And that's, again, that balancing act because you need to make sure that you can continue to keep electricity affordable for everyone. And broadband has also played into this as we've had more member owners have access to high-speed internet access. That is actually raising expectations now for some member consumers that perhaps didn't have access to those tools in the past. Yeah, and they turn to their co-ops because they expect their co-ops to to help them improve their lives as they always have. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. 
And so you're in regular contact with your member distribution co-ops. Can you kind of give us a sense of some of the unique ways or unique challenges that they're facing, some of the ways that they're reacting to these new consumer demands? Yes. Our cooperatives started changing how they do bill pay, for instance, quite some time ago. And so they have different things that are available to the consumers as pay as you go. They have uh, billing at different times of the month. They have done different things in response to member requests. Other things that they've done is, uh, you know, we did a lot of survey work and, and consumers were interested in solar, for instance. So we did community solar quite some time ago, and that was a an affordable and manageable way to provide solar to communities or to individuals that perhaps weren't in a position to put solar on their homes. And we have to manage pace with this transition and having a lot of solar or a lot of EV charging going on when we're not quite position for it yet, although we're working on that, is something we have to manage. And so providing alternatives for individuals is something that we've continued to do. Other types of tools have also been improving our presence in social media and on the internet. That's where people go. We've done a lot of survey work, and when people want to manage costs or they want to find out about solar or or battery or different technologies, EVs, electric cooperatives need to be in that space, or those members are going to go somewhere else for that information, and it's not always reliable. So I want to talk a little bit about how we can all agree that the intensity of weather events right now is increasing. We're talking about the reliability and the resilience factor. This is putting pressure on the co-op to increase the way they keep the electrons flowing at a time when their members maybe have less and less tolerance for the outages that these more intense storms create. Can you talk a little bit about what co-ops are doing in in North Carolina and and more generally to get that resiliency up and on the operations side in terms of the equipment? that they're they're deploying and the grid itself. Yes. Well, as part of our focus, and we have a vision called the brighter future, and as part of that focus and and assisting with those expectations on reliability or resilience, the distribution cooperatives in North Carolina have been working with their generation transmission cooperative to put in smart grids, for instance. Smart grids have been actually around for a while. It's just how we're using them is different. That's the innovative part. So it has a renewable component to it in many cases, um, or a biodigester, for instance, in an ag application. We put in battery. We also uh, have a microcontroller, so we can actually manage it from Raleigh, or that local distribution cooperative can manage it. We also have sometimes community solar. If the solar is not on the homes in, in an area, we'll do it that way. And we build them large enough so we can actually have the, in most cases it's a CNI type of application, that they can provide power if there's an outage to the surrounding homes. So if anything, we're doing demonstration projects, we're experimenting, we're trying different things, we're actually using technology sometimes differently than it was intended, and we're working with our members in a distribution operation aspect through a distributed energy management system to manage all this to get some visibility. We've got to be able to see what's behind the meter as well as what's at that delivery point. So this is, you know, evolving. We're working through it. There's a lot of places it can go. I'd like to hear your thoughts on how co-ops are uniquely kind of positioned to address and respond to these challenges. Because to hear you talk about it, you're trying new things, you're experimenting, you're having a little bit of fun with solving these problems. Well, it is challenging. I'm not going to say it's not. And again, trying to stay within that golden triangle to keep expenses down and to manage the demonstrations in a way that they can be scalable over time and everybody benefits across the portfolio for North Carolina. That's certainly a, a, a real focus from a G&T perspective. But it is fun. And it's actually allowing us to recruit smart young people that want to solve these problems. And the other things that it brings to us is if we can use the grid more efficiently. And that's certainly what cooperatives are all about. It's the cooperative difference. How can we do things in a way that are efficient and help our members either mitigate costs or save money? 
we can improve reliability, we can improve coordination. You know, if we're doing those things, then that's what electric cooperatives are all about. And the cooperative difference allows us to have that engagement with the member owner at the end of the line for them to understand the things that we are doing to provide them the same opportunities, the same quality of life as somebody has in a large urban environment. Now, before I let you go, I want to ask you one question because you're, you are, are recognized as one of the preeminent communicators in the co-op program. You had mentioned earlier about being on these channels where members are. How important is it to keep up these two-way communications with members in this particular time? Well, sure. It's imperative for us right now because there's so much change. Whenever there's change, there can be fear. And the way to combat fear is awareness and education, and then excellent implementation of whatever you're doing, and then a feedback. That goes for us in in having that conversation in an ongoing conversation with our member owners. And that's true for the distribution cooperatives, and it's also true for statewide organizations, for instance. So positioning ourselves on the front end of those conversations is really important. We've had a recent big campaign push on communications for home solar. We have our member owners, some of which are being taken advantage of, or others that we don't know that have solar on their homes or their businesses, and we need to know that for obviously reliability and grid management perspective. So getting ahead in those conversations, having them, not being afraid to talk about these things that may be a little different than what we're used to, I think is really important because you're much better off to have those types of conversations on the front end than on the back end. And sometimes those don't go so well. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a fascinating time, and I I really appreciate you coming on, Nell, and giving us your expertise on this. Well, thanks so much, Scott. Happy to be here. Let's take a break here for a word from our sponsor, and when we come back, we'll talk about how member expectations are impacting decisions at the generation and transmission level. Along Those Lines is made possible by TextPower, which provides a two-way texting platform to over 45% of the nation's 100 largest electric cooperatives, plus over 100 others, as small as 5,000 meters. Benefits include reducing incoming calls during outages by over 70%, shedding load during peak periods, and reducing broken payment arrangements and truck rolls. TextPower's platform is integrated with various OMS, CIS, and SCADA systems. I am Peter Mohor from Rappahannock Electric Cooperative in Fredericksburg, Virginia. You're listening to Along Those Lines. Welcome back. Next up, we'll hear from Lisa Johnson about how member expectations are shaping how Seminole Electric and its member cooperatives do business. Lisa, welcome to the podcast. This is your second time on, so thanks for coming back. Oh, thanks, Scott. Appreciate the invitation. Okay, so we talked to Nell Hotchkiss in North Carolina about sort of the statewide perspective on this member expectation trend. I want to get you to sort of specifically talk about the generation side, the operational side. What are you seeing in Florida? What are some of the things that consumer members are asking for now that they weren't asking for, say, five or 10 years ago? Interesting question. I think consumers are looking for different ways to engage with their cooperative. I see a lot of that. I hear a lot of that from our member cooperatives here in Florida. You know, that takes on a lot of different characteristics, I think. You see communications maybe being one of the biggest pieces of that, you know, how the consumer interacts with their co-op, thinking about ways to use technology differently in terms of that interaction, whether it's providing information and input, whether it's receiving information from their co-op, and certainly the routine things like paying their bills or understanding their usage or knowing how they can be involved with their cooperative in programs that are available or opportunities to save energy and electricity. So I think that's a big one that I see. Certainly there's interest in the changing transition in fuel sources and generation sources. I think we see that. There's a curiosity, I think, about new technology as well, whether that's on the generation side or whether that's things like electric vehicles. So I see those changes, but I would also tell you that at the heart of it, I also see this continuing focus on reliability The lights need to be on when they want the lights on and competitive cost and affordability. Yeah, and I I definitely want to get into the reliability side in in a minute. As the G&T 
How have you sort of had to adapt and evolve what you offer to your member cooperatives in terms of, you mentioned the curiosity about renewables, EVs, uh, efficiency programs. Is that something that you as the G&T are helping them sort of fill that need for? We are. Actually, you know, I put it in the bucket of if our members need support, if our members are looking to explore something new or different, and we as Seminole, as their GNT, can help them, either facilitating information, providing a collective response to a question or a topic by providing them resources uh, and working collaboratively to do that. I think we're doing that on a lot of different fronts. We're certainly going through a transition with our generation portfolio, have been for the last five or so years. But we're not only educating our members about what that transition looks like, but we're helping them make sure they can communicate that to their member consumers. We're helping them with electric vehicle education and supporting strategy development around infrastructure there. So I think there's a lot of examples, but I put it back to if our members need something, if our members are wanting to discuss something, and we know there's so much of what's happening in this energy transition transition, it's affecting everything from the wholesale provider, which we are, to the end use consumer. And so having that collaborative approach, I think, is crucial to coming up with really good solutions. You mentioned reliability and the whole question of resiliency. In Florida, you're sort of at ground zero on some of the impacts of more extreme weather that we've seen, heat waves, hurricanes, flooding, wildfires. These threats are becoming more prominent at a time when our members, our consumer members, have less tolerance for the outages that they create. Are you doing anything different at the GNT level to help your co-ops sort of head those things off and to be there to keep the lights on despite really, really big challenges? Yes, and, and these are big challenges. I think, you know, it comes in a lot of different facets of our business. So let me give you a few examples you know, hurricane preparation for us is just, it's just business as usual in Florida. You don't live down here without having a really good program for how to prepare for hurricane season, how to carry the business through hurricane season, and then how to look back on what actually occurred during that six-month time frame each year. So every year we've been through this since I joined Seminole back in 2013. I see us going through that cycle, and every year we improve on our process. Every year we take lessons learned from the season, working in collaboration with our members to think about, did we do all the things we could have done in terms of planning for this season? Did we respond as we should have if there was an event? What are the things we took away from that? How do we build that into the next year's cycle? So it's a continuous improvement process that helps us really think actively in each of those phases, how we can make sure that resilience is top of mind, that we have the planning in place that we think makes sense. The other thing I would mention just as an example is with some of the transition we're seeing in the generation mix. It's happening across the country. It's happening here in Florida. As we introduce more of the intermittent resources into our generation mix, we're all having to think differently about how we plan. Some of the more traditional methods of planning, it's not just about making sure you have enough capability or capacity on the ground to generate power. It's of what you have, are you going to be able to ensure that you can generate the amount of energy required at that moment in time to meet all those load requirements? So that resource adequacy question is becoming a much more important component. Yeah. And as someone who is a, one of the more gifted communicators in the program, some of these things that we're doing as co-ops to meet these member expectations can be a little esoteric, and they may not be something that are obvious on their face. What's the role of communications at the GNT level and at the co-op level in letting members know that this is what you're doing and this is what they're getting for their kilowatt dollars? Oh, it's so important, Scott. I think, you know, predominantly as the wholesale provider, we are not doing a lot of direct communication with the unused consumer, but I think we have a great working process with our member cooperatives on getting our communications teams together on a regular basis. They meet, they talk, they discuss topics of interest, they discuss the prickly topics that sometimes are hard to communicate because they're complex in nature. 
they're hard to communicate because it's impacting the end use consumer in a way that, you know, maybe makes that discussion more challenging. And I know you keep up contacts with your peers in the co-op program. Could you sort of give an assessment on how you think co-ops are doing generally in meeting these needs? Because, I mean, it varies territory to territory, region to region. Do you think that co-ops are particularly well positioned to respond to these new pressures from the members? Oh, I think co-ops are in the best position to respond to these expectations and these changes. I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, some of the key attributes of co-ops that have always been there and are still there today and are kind of shining maybe today more than in other parts of our industry are a focus on the member, whether that's the distribution cooperative member looking at it from a G&T or the end use consumer member. We are not for profit. We are here to make sure that we're providing reliable, cost competitive, and affordable electricity in a safe manner, in a sustainable manner, in a way that makes sense now and in the future. And, you know, those messages to me, even if there's a lot of variation across a member consumer, you know, base or particular co-ops member consumer population, I think at the heart of it, they want to know that their co-op cares about them. They want to know that we are making decisions for the short term and the long term that balance the need for transition, the need for embedding new technology in the process while still getting all that we can out of the investments that we've made over the years to support those member consumers' needs. And so if I think across, you know, the country and I talk with some of my peers and I look at what we're doing here at Seminole, I really think that we are not only actively, but aggressively in some ways, in the most positive way, thinking about how do we not only meet those expectations, both of the consumer that maybe has been with us for a long time, and maybe their expectations are sort of evolving at a nice pace, and then we have some brand new member consumers that are coming in with a lot of new ideas. Let's make sure we can match that spectrum of needs and really let them know that as their co-op, as their not only their energy provider, but the entity that sits inside their community and is part of the fabric of that community, which is so important to those end-use consumers at the end of the day, that that's kind of what we all have in common. Well, it's fascinating. It's a really dynamic time. And Lisa, I appreciate you coming on and helping sort of explain it to us. You're such a great voice on the program. Appreciate it, Scott. And thanks to you, our listeners, and to our sponsor, Text Power. For more on this and other podcasts, visit us at electric.coop. Until next time, for Along Those Lines, I'm Scott Hoffman. I'm Barbara Jenkins from Arkansas Valley Electric Cooperative Corporation in Ozark, Arkansas. Thanks for listening to Along Those Lines. Subscribe and rate us on your favorite podcast app.